I invite you to open up your Bibles to John chapter 7. John chapter 7. You know what, one of these days I'm going to remember to put this microphone on before I actually get up here. So if you want to go ahead and turn to John chapter 7 while I get this turned on. John chapter 7. And I will just say, if you want to go ahead and put a bookmark in the, the Gospel of John, we're actually going to be going to several, just several passages uh, this morning throughout the lesson. If you weren't here last week, what I, uh, the morning lesson, I started by a new series that was really focused on the subject of authority, and more specifically, God's authority. And we made a few points about that, one being that, you know, well, we concluded that the reality of authority in our lives, whether it be our own standard or uh, someone else's, that's just inescapable. Uh, authority is a part of objective reality, no matter what we want to say, no matter what uh, anyone would want to say about that. Um, but also, not only that that reality is, is there, but that we need to make sure that, that we are coming to the ultimate standard, the ultimate authority, God's standard, the only one that actually counts. And we've been using Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17 as uh, a kind of um, foundation of this series, that in whatever we do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. And that truly is our goal. We mean that when we uh, cite that passage, and we mean that when we um, read through it and when we uh, use it over and over again. We use it for good reason. Um, and that is because we believe that literally everything we do needs to be connected to God. And what I want to do is just kind of emphasize that a little bit more just as we go throughout this series. But even today, uh, as we look at this idea of doing everything in God's name, all in uh, the name of Jesus, what I, look at, what I want to look at more specifically is uh, the, the, the topic of authority specifically in Jesus' life. And more so specifically than that, how he viewed it. What was Jesus' attitude of authority um, throughout his life? And so uh, beginning in John chapter 7, I just want to read just one passage of many that we're going to go through in John. But beginning in, uh, uh, at the beginning of John chapter 7, you find that it is around the time of the Feast of Booths. And so the Jews all kind of congregate in one area. Uh, Jesus finally gets to, uh, finally, uh, gets to the temple and starts preaching in the temple. And as he's preaching, the, the Jews, they just become astonished at what he's saying. And in verse 15, they say, How has this man become learned, having never been educated? So Jesus answered them and said, my teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone is willing to do his will, he will know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak for myself. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who is seeking the glory of the one who sent him, he is true, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Now, really what I want to do throughout this study is just kind of follow what I think is a good progression in the verses we just read. There are going to be three points that we focus on but all kind of geared around what I think uh, is a question that is posed by uh, the teaching Jesus gives here. And that is the question, whose glory are we seeking? Whose glory am I seeking? Whose glory are you seeking? Now, with Jesus, you can answer the question very quickly. It's God's. But again, what I want to do, three points this morning that we're going to go through, uh, just in the progression beginning in verse 16, Jesus only spoke the words of his Father. And in verse 17, he never put his own will over his father's. And ultimately, as we see in verse 18, it is because his desire was to please and satisfy his father's will and to do his father's works. And nothing more. No one else's. And so we're going to follow that progression uh, this morning. So again, at the, the very uh, beginning, the first point that I want to look at is this idea that we find in verse 16, where Jesus says, this teaching is not mine, but my father's. Um, again, if you're still in John, just turn over a page in John chapter 8. John chapter 8. Um, you know, one reason that I like John so much is because I think one consistent theme throughout this gospel is that John is trying to really, he's trying to, I think, make the case. Uh, the biblical case for the fact that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus is God. I think that's why he, in fact, starts that way in John chapter 1. Then in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God. And then you go throughout the chapter 1 and you find that that Word is Jesus, manifested in the flesh. And so, uh, that's just one of the themes that you find just woven throughout this gospel. But another theme I think you find, and, and one of the reasons that I wanted to use this specific gospel uh, a lot in this study this morning is that 
over and over again, you find in Jesus' language this idea of, of everything that he speaks and everything that he does is by the Father's initiative, not my own. Uh, beginning in verse 21 of John chapter 8, in verse 21, he, it says, He said again to them, I go away and you will seek me and will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews were saying, surely he will not kill himself, will he? Since he says, where I am going, you cannot come. And he was saying to them, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So they were saying to him, who are you? And Jesus said to them, what have I been saying to you from the beginning? I have many things to speak and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true. And the things which I heard from him, these I speak to the world. They did not realize that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. As he spoke these things, many came to believe in him. Now, we're going to go to John chapter 14 in just a moment, where he says essentially the same thing. But just from the very beginning, what you are going to see over and over again throughout this, this lesson this morning is this idea where Jesus says repeatedly, everything I do, it is, it is seriously, truly, because the Father has given me that work or the Father has given me those words to speak. And I'm only going to repeat what he gives me. Uh, but over in, in chapter 14, beginning in verse 21, in somewhat similar, he says, He who is my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, what then has uh, happened that you are going to disclose yourself to us and not the world? And Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him. We will come to him and make our abode with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. And, and so once again, you find uh, this idea that it is not just, this isn't just coming off the top of Jesus' head, but everything he speaks, it's, 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 it's um, calculated to the degree that it has been given to him. Um, also, I would just add to that, that as you look at the very beginning of what we read in this passage in John chapter 14, is that I think love for those commandments is, is a part of this. One of the reasons that Jesus truly does um, practice what he preaches here is because I really do believe he loves the commandments. And I think that, like John says in 1 John, that the commandments are not burdensome to Jesus. It's, it's very hard to become burdened down uh, by, uh, by an activity. It's very hard to be burdened down by something if you love what you're doing all the while. Uh, that's why sometimes, you know, sometimes there's that adage that we say where you never work a day in your life if, if, you, love what, if you love your job, if you love what you're doing. Jesus, he loved what he did, and he loved what he preached. And I do think that there's a very strong uh, emphasis throughout the scriptures, and even in John, uh, obviously, with that connection to not looking at his commandments as burdensome, but loving the fact that we can uh, actually know his commandments, but also do them. And so that, from the very outset of the book, what you find is that Jesus makes this clear. Um, over in John chapter 5, we're going to come back to this passage in just a moment in the next uh, point, but in John chapter 5... In verse 19, in verse 19 of John chapter 5, beginning, it says, Therefore Jesus answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it, unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. And then skipping down to verse 30, he says something very similar. I can do nothing on my own initiative. As I hear, I judge. My judgment is just because I do not seek my own will but the will of him who sent me. Now, again, we'll come back to that in just a moment. Obviously, as we look more into verse uh, 17 of John chapter 7, where he talks about that, that idea of being, someone being willing to do the will of the Father. But, but all this, one of the reasons I wanted to read through this was because Jesus is the very Son of God. And, and we understand that. And, and as we already said, one of the consistent themes of John's gospel is to get that point across, that he is divine. He is deity. He is God manifested in the flesh. And so everything that he says, it literally, I mean, it literally is the word of God. And so everything he says, it needs to be held up uh, with the, the utmost respect and reverence when we approach it. But though he is the son of God, he never, he never uh, speaks beyond what his father has given him. 
And so before we even move on, one thing that I'd like to mention, and, and we'll talk more about the silence of God as we go throughout this series. I have a, one lesson specifically designed to talk about just the silence of God and how we have to approach that. But from the very beginning, what you find with the attitude that Jesus has about his father's authority in his life, even from the very beginning, what you find is uh, this kind of respect of how you approach the very silence of God. Jesus doesn't speak when the father hasn't spoken. And, you know, just from the beginning of the study, I wonder how many times have you talked to someone or maybe how many times have we said something or spoken on something that God has not bound or God has not spoken. And we need to be very cautious because I think that Jesus gives us an example all throughout his life of, of how to approach that very, uh, that very topic. The things that, he, that God has not spoken on specifically. Uh, he only speaks what God has given him, what he's heard from the Father. Um, and so I think there is just a lesson very simply there in how Jesus views the silence of God. But finally, over in John chapter 12, Jesus never loses sight of the value of God's word, of his Father's word. Over in John chapter 12. And, I, and you know, I don't, want this, uh, I don't want it to seem very repetitive as we go throughout the study this morning, but it will be. Because John really tries to get the point down, emphasizes the point that Jesus makes throughout his life. That, that he only does what the Father wills for him to do. John chapter 12, beginning in verse 49, it says, For I did not speak on my own initiative, once again, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. I know that his commandment is eternal life. Therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. Now, you know... We can say the same things we already have about some of the passages we've read throughout John already. But one thing that I think is so very uh, important is the fact that Jesus, obviously, being God, being the Son of God, He knows the mind of God. And He knows the, the ultimate value of everything, every commandment that's given. That is the, the, uh, that's a similarity that we do not have. There are going to be times where we do not always see the benefit of every single commandment. There are going to be times where we do not see the benefit of every single passage from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Jesus could look at all of those things. He could look at every passage and say, I know exactly why that was written down. I know exactly why God said this, and I know exactly why this law was put into place. But just very frankly, sometimes we're not going to be able to be. And maybe oftentimes we're not going to be able to be. Uh, again, unless God has actually given us some, some more insight as to why, why some of these things were written down. Regardless, though, though I may not perceive the value of God's commandment, just from a carnal mindset, just from our limited perspectives, Jesus reveals the ultimate value of following it. And that ultimate value is, if nothing else, it is eternal life. Jesus makes that clear over and over again throughout his ministry, that the words of God literally lead to eternal life. That is what you need to have salvation. That is what you need, uh, as he talks to, to um, the, the, the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4. And I have water that, that you do not know about, that, that, will, that, you will, that if you should you drink, you'll never thirst again. In the same way, that kind of sustenance, we need to look at the word in that same way. And we'll look at, uh, at that passage specifically in just a moment. But all this just to say, Jesus has a very... Um, he has a very strict hermeneutical approach when it comes to the words of God. And that is, what God says, I'm going to repeat, no matter what. And uh, I, I would say that from his example, what we find is, if God hasn't spoken on it, that's not what I'm going to repeat. I'm not going to repeat nothing. And I'm not going to speak on it unless the Father has given me revelation. Now, moving on to the second point. As we said, uh, in, in this idea of being willing to do his will, and Jesus especially being, will, uh, being willing to do the Lord's will. Uh, the Father's will. Every single one of his actions is determined by God. You can go back to John chapter 5, verses, 15, uh, verses 19 and 30, and you can read that again. We won't this morning. But just that idea that nothing I do is by my own initiative. It is specifically by the Father's. And I'm not going to act. I'm not going to walk. I'm not going to talk unless God has given me that. And, you know, sometimes we look at the example of Christ. People will look at the example of Christ as you're studying through the gospel. And especially when it comes to the... the um, moments where we have to talk about authority or that becomes maybe a topical study for a moment. You know, people will look at things that, that, uh, that Jesus did and how extreme he was in his hermeneutical approach to God's word. And, and they might say, well, you, you just, you can't, you can't do that today. You, I mean, 
Jesus did everything, every action was determined by the Father. Well, you can't necessarily do that today. Well, I, to a degree, there are some people in, in denominations that would, I think, make an extreme, a very uh, erroneous case about how maybe uh, the Holy Spirit will you know, directly guide us to make every single decision. He'll literally put our hand up to do an action. I don't think that's the case. But there is something to take from this in the fact that you, you really can't act independently of God today. And, and Jesus truly believed that. And I think that we need to believe that today. That every single action, it can't be disconnected. And, I, and hopefully we'll make that case as we go throughout. But over in John chapter 14, why I think that this can be the case still. John chapter 14, <clears throat> beginning in verse 8 of John chapter 14. It says that Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it is enough for us. In verse 9, Jesus answers, Have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. And so you look at that, that this passage here. Sometimes you'll see um, uh, maybe a bumper sticker on someone's car, and you even see it sometimes on, on social media. Someone would, will, you know, Say, WWJD, what, what would Jesus do? I don't know if that's really the phrase that we should be using. I think the better phrase is, what did Jesus do? Because we have that. We actually have his life recorded for us, so that way we can mimic it, so that way we can imitate it. As Paul says, I, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Uh, Paul isn't just saying that, that there's, a vague, there's, there's a vague sense of what we need to do. No, you can imitate this really well, actually. Because you just have to look, you have to listen to God and, and maybe stop speaking for a moment and just listen to his words. And listen to the revelation that he's given us specifically when it comes to that example that Jesus gives us. But it, again, sometimes people will look at us and, and say, when we talk about Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17, well, you can't, not every decision can be made based off of God. And I'm sorry, I just can't come to that conclusion. I, I, I don't see that anywhere in the scriptures. You can't say that you can act independently or make any decision in your life independently from God's will. Otherwise, we're going to spiral into, uh, and we're going to spiral into even worse and worse approaches on how to look at God's word and ultimately get into erroneous um, doctrines and make and, and make bad decisions ourselves that go against the word of God. So beyond that. Not only does he make the case that every single action is determined by God, but he takes this so seriously that unless his father has prompted him, he won't move forward. Over in Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. This is... Uh, Adam actually, I think, read through this a little bit this morning. Uh, we got to listen to the first couple of chapters of Matthew 4 as they were testing out the microphone, and it was, it was good to get the context leading up to this moment. But uh, in, in Matthew chapter 4, what you find, if you weren't able to hear that earlier this morning, is that Jesus is in the, uh, is in the wilderness. And he's been led into the wilderness by the Spirit, it says in verse 1 of chapter 4, to be tempted by the devil. In verse 2 it says, After he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. And how does Jesus answer him? It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Let me just say, I do think that there's a reason that we get that little uh, uh, anecdote there, that Jesus did become hungry. Can you imagine going without food for 40 days and nights? especially in the wilderness, in, in the heat, in the struggle of the wilderness, that's, that's not an easy task. And I think especially uh, people in our culture today, I, I don't think they make a half that long. But here, it's making, a, a, it's making a, just a, a common point, I think just even more so emulating the fact that this is Jesus, this is God manifested in, in flesh, uh, in humanity. Uh, and kind of showing these, these human traits, these human uh, necessities of life that he, has, uh, that he has willfully bound himself to, or come under, rather. But, so he is obviously very hungry. He is starving. And I think that's a part of the temptation. Hey, listen, you, if you know how long you've been fasting. Do you know how long that you've been without food? If you don't, if you don't eat soon, if you, don't, uh, if you keep going at this rate, you're going to die. 
And I think that maybe a scientific case could be made for that, that maybe the body, the physical body, couldn't take much more. But how does Jesus respond? God has not said for me to do anything. God has not told me to make bread out of these stones. So guess what? I'm not going to. Now, again, we are having a Bible study with somebody. Or maybe we look at that ourselves and we think, well, that's a, that's a bit extreme, don't you think? All I'm saying is this is how Jesus respects the very word of God and the will of God in his life. He really does not act unless he has a good reason from his father. And I think that there is a very direct correlation, or at least there should be a direct application in our lives. That, you know, though others, you know, sometimes people will say that, as we already said, well, that's a bit extreme. You don't expect me to stop doing, a, you know, X, Y, or Z, or you don't expect me to start doing this. Well, again, let's just look at Jesus and look how seriously he took this. Jesus said, I will, I will starve before I do anything that has not been prescribed by the Lord, by my Father. I will starve. Do we have that same kind of mentality? Do we have that same kind of uh, emotional tie into the very words of God? I think this uh, brings us over to John chapter 4. What we were just kind of mentioning a moment ago in John chapter 4. <clears throat> After his encounter with the... the um, the uh, Samaritan woman, uh, Sam <laughs> I don't know why I can't say that word. Tonight. He was talking to the widow uh, and um, the adulterous woman. And in verse uh, 34 beginning, John chapter 4 beginning in verse, uh, well, we'll begin in verse 31. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples were saying to one another, no one brought him anything to eat, did he? And Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Now, especially in light of what we just read in Matthew chapter 4, does that seem like Jesus is just saying this, you know, flippantly or just kind of giving a nice little platitude? No, this isn't just some, this isn't just some emotionless truism that, that, that Jesus is giving to his disciples. No, he is saying, this is my way of life, and it needs to be yours. I have food that you do not know about. He's going to give it to them. And yet... You don't find, I would say, at least, especially in the religious world today, uh, prominently, you don't find that kind of attitude. Rather, it's the attitude that you find in John chapter 6, John chapters 5 and 6. After Jesus had fed those crowds with physical bread, what do they, why did they come back to him? Well, not to get the bread of life, which he says is more important, which, which he says, this is what you need to be striving for. You've come to me for the food for the belly. But here I am. I'm the bread of life, and I'm yours if you decide to if you decide to have me, if you decide to accept me. But the people, they start walking away. And why is that? Because they don't view it, they don't view Jesus. They don't view the will of God in the same way that Jesus does. The will of the Father in the same way that Jesus does. Jesus says, I will starve before I take another step. I will starve before I make another decision unless it is prescribed by God. And here in the people in John chapter 6 say, I, would, <laughs> I, I refuse to starve. This is the only reason I come to God because I want these, these physical blessings. And we need to have the attitude, we need to have the mindset of Christ when it comes to the very will of God, his, his authority, and what he wants us to do in our own lives. Well, finally, getting to that last verse we read at the beginning of, of uh, uh, the study this morning, in verse 18, Jesus does all of this ultimately because he wants glory for his Father. Not necessarily gl glory for himself, but glory for his Father. Again, back in John chapter 8, I just want to reread that those two verses specifically. John chapter 8 in verse 28 beginning. It says, So Jesus said, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He. And I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me. And He who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. Or I, I, I believe... Uh, Yes, yes, I, I, I thought I had skipped a sentence. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. And as he spoke these things, many came to believe in him. Why does Jesus do these things? Because he wants to please his Father. Why does Jesus go to such great lengths to do these things? He very simply wants to satisfy the commandments. He wants to satisfy the will, the initiative of his Father. Not necessarily his carnal impulses, but rather he wants to bring glory to his, to his God. In, in uh, John chapter 17, beginning in verse 1, 
It says, Jesus spoke these things, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. So, so why does Jesus say, it, here's a moment where Jesus says, glorify me, glorify your Son. But is it just because Jesus wants to be given honor? Is it just because Jesus wants to have, uh, you know, all of this kind of, uh, th th this, this um, position of, of great glory and honor in the sight of men? Well, we already read in Philippians chapter 2, or at least we alluded to in Philippians chapter 2, that Jesus, though he was God, he did not utilize that. You know, if, if we were um, in Jesus' position, I think that we often, I remember listening to a study on, on just the crucifixion of Jesus. And you know how reflexive we can sometimes be when it comes to just physical pain. You know, I, I don't, I don't, you've never seen me have to deal with a wasp or a hornet in any capacity. But uh, especially at Buckhorn, they did. Because for some reason, they kept, these wasps kept being able to come in through the walls somehow. And they kept flying around me while I was trying to preach a few lessons. And uh, let me just tell you, that was not one of my proudest moments because what you see is me being very reflexive. I, you know, just, and you're bobbing your head, you're bobbing weave because you're not trying to get stung. And that's just, just with a tiny little hornet, just with a tiny little wasp. Can you imagine being beaten, scourged, flogged? And on top of all of that, the shame of it all. And, and, and the, being spat upon and mocked while you're getting this undue, unjust uh, punishment. Can you imagine being Jesus, having the ability to call down legions of angels? And yet, he accepts that pain. Again, with how reflexive we are with it, I think I would immediately said, nope, done. You're done. But that's not how Jesus was. And he didn't utilize that power, that authority that he had as God manifested in the flesh. And why was that? Because everything he did, he wanted to bring glory to his Father, and he did it uh, out of love for us. He, uh, and that brings us into the next point. Not only did he ask for, uh, did he ask for uh, glory for himself, specifically to glorify his Father, not just for, for carnal impulses, but for his Father. But on the other hand, as we were just mentioning a moment ago, he cared about what God wanted, not even when it was what was necessarily beneficial to him. Uh, as we were talking about with the cross just a moment ago, in Matthew chapter 26, Matthew chapter 26 in verse 39. Matthew chapter 26 in verse 39. It says, he, it, right before this, Jesus said to his disciples that his soul was deeply grieved to the point of death. And he says, remain here and keep watch with me. So in verse 39, he went a little beyond them and he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So you men could not keep watch with me for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again a second time and prayed, saying, My father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, your will be done. Again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy, and he left them again and went away and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. Jesus, being so very adamant to, in this moment of, of physical, emotional uh, turmoil, what does he do? He goes to the Father in prayer. And there's, and there's a lesson in that uh, by itself. But what is he praying about? Obviously the crucifixion. And obviously this sacrifice that he is going to fulfill for all of mankind. Now, we look at this passage, and while, and all, you know, we look at this sometimes, and, and I think sometimes we may get confused about Jesus saying, let this, let this cup pass from me. This was the very reason he came. It was. But does that mean that Jesus is going to look at something so terrible, so evil, that, there, that, that here his creation is going to put God to death? They're going to put the pure and only perfect human being to ever live to death for none other than the truth. And I don't think that Jesus necessarily has to look forward to that kind of pain and that kind of evil. I don't think it would make sense if he did. But what does he do? He doesn't say, I don't want to go through this, so God, may it not happen ever. He says, if this is the way, then I want it to be done. And you just go over back over to John in chapter 18. John chapter 18. Look at what uh, John writes down 
in Jesus' response uh, to Peter. Peter, as, as the, the, the guards are trying to arrest Jesus, Peter cuts off one of the, the uh, Ear, it cuts off one of the ears of, I believe it was the servant of one of the high priests, um, or something like that. And right after that, how does Jesus respond in John chapter 18 and verse 11? So Jesus said to Peter, put the sword into the sheath. The cup which the, or, uh, the, cup which the Father has given me, shall I not drink it? And so here he was just a moment ago saying, let this cup pass for me, but not my will. Your will be done. Does it sound like when it does come... When the, father's, when the prayer has been answered, that Jesus says, that Jesus kind of responds the way we do sometimes when we don't get the answer we want. Well, just hang it all then. I guess, I, I guess I'm just never going to get what I want. No, Jesus doesn't respond that way. He says, how am I going to reject? How am I not going to accept the cup that the Father has given to me? So put your sword away and you accept it. And accept it rightly. But... Over and over again, you find this, I, I think, this balance that no matter what, when, he's, when he is facing, you know, those more positive moments where he can receive glory on himself specifically, he does it not to, to please himself, but rather to please God and to bring more glory to God. And in the moments where he's suffering, in the moments where there's much affliction, he, he suffers that willfully and he suffers it in a godly way, again, to bring more glory to God. Now... More uh, application as we, with these last two points as we look uh, uh, at, at the attitude and the perspective of Jesus when it comes to authority in his own life. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31, it's kind of similar to Colossians 3. But, it, but Paul says, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Everything that we do, every decision we make, we make it because we want to please God and we want to make sure that, that, that we are uh, stepping beyond the boundaries that he set. But also it is because we are trying, we are striving to bring glory to him in the same way that Jesus did. Now with everything we just talked about with the example of Jesus, now ask, ask yourself, I'm me, Luke Caps, am I doing everything that Jesus did? Am I responding in the same ways that Jesus did when faced with suffering and affliction or in the moments that are not that hard? Am I still focused on trying to bring glory to God? We need to ask ourselves that kind of a question. But I will just say that when we decide to go outside of, of God's authority, when we decide to start speaking on the things that God has not spoken of, when we decide to reject it just, you know, all, all outright altogether, I think ultimately we glorify ourselves when we make decisions that are completely disconnected from God's word or his will. As we've already stated a few times, sometimes people will say, well, you, with, with their actions, they're doing something that's clearly um, prohibited or, or, or just not, uh, or, or just that God has been silent about. And they say something like, well, I'm, not, I'm really not doing this. This is obviously not because I'm trying to bring glory to myself. I'm not trying to bring honor to myself. I'm trying to be, bring honor to God. And no matter... Maybe sometimes people even believe that. But guess what? When it comes to worship, when you have the very clear revelation of God and you decide that you're going to bring in instruments because, hey, we're just trying to make sure that we get the most amount of people in the building and we're just trying to make sure that we bring even more glory to God. Guess what? If he has said something, uh, if he has not revealed it, if he has not spoken about it, and you're going outside of his word, outside of his authority, his standard, then you're not bringing glory to him. Who else can you be bringing glory to? Ourself. And, and you could think of other examples, not just when it comes to our worship. But, but you are bringing glory to yourself when you try to hold up something that, that God ultimately has said either no on or that, he doesn't, or that he has not spoken much about in the first place. I think 1 Chronicles chapter 13 is a very good example of this, of both actually, because in one instance you have David and the rest of the people, they're completely ignoring everything that God had said previously about how to carry the Ark of the Covenant. And then to another degree, they're adding things into uh, how to, uh, they've changed and added to how to trans, you know, transport the Ark of the Covenant. With, that, with, the, with the, um, the cart that is led by the oxen. And so in both instances, you have that exact, uh, you have both of those in that story, but what happens? How does it end? As we studied last week, when it comes to man making their own decisions and coming to their own wisdom, it leads to death and it leads to destruction every time. And while it may not be, uh, you know, immediate, just, you know, physical death right in the moment, even today, what you have is devastating effects. 
when we decide to go outside of the authority of God. Because you're teaching something with everything that you do. You're teaching something with every uh, decision that you make. And so finally, with all that being said, our decisions can't start with what, what makes me feel good, what sounds good to me, what looks good to me, what feels good to me, what's satisfying to me. It can never start there. It has to start with what is pleasing to God. That's the question we need to ask whenever we decide, whenever we're going to make a decision, whenever we're going to move forward. It needs to be because God has, because from the will of God, we know that that is justified. That is a good path. And so, as we already mentioned, things like worship. We want to make sure that we do only what the Lord has spoken. And we want to make sure that we bring glory to Him. And the only way we do that is that we obey Him fully. That comes, uh, you can think about something like um, modesty. Something as simple as modesty. You know, immediately when, when we see something in the store, we say, well, may, do I look good in this? Is that the first question we need to ask? No, the first question needs to be, well, does God say that this is modest? Does God, is this going to cover everything that God has associated, every body part that God has associated with nakedness? If so, then we can get, get, at some point, get to the question of, does this make me look good? But it can't start there. And yet so many times you have people saying, well, you know, I, maybe that's what it says, but it just, it makes me look so nice and it makes me feel good. And it's like, okay, but to whom does it look good? And to whom does it make feel good? It's, not a, it's never been. It's never been about you necessarily. Now, I think that as we went back to the very first point of the study, love for God's commandments needs to be there. Uh, but we need to grow in that maturity, grow in that kind of obedience. So, you know, especially today, you have, uh, there's a lot of social media um, platforms that you can use. But especially, like, you go to TikTok or you go to Facebook or Instagram and you have all of these influencers telling Especially, it's, it's, I think it's much more so uh, pointed towards um, women. But you have, them telling, uh, you have them telling even Christian women, sisters in Christ, that listen, you are going to look terrible. You are going to be the ugliest person in the room, in your community, unless you do this. Unless you dress this kind of way. Unless you act this kind of way. And, and you can have that on the other side, too. It's not just a, a, an issue with women, though I do think that when it comes to fashion, it is much more, it is much more pointed because women do. I, I, I don't think men really care as much about what they wear necessarily. I had to change a tie this morning because I just, hey, that looks good. I haven't worn it in a while. I put it on. You know, about 20 minutes before we left, Paige said, that doesn't match. You're going to have to change. And so I did. Men just don't care about it in the same way. It is more pointed in some way. That, but there are other things that, that men have struggles with. But I, all that just to say, women, is your standard of beauty decided by TikTok or what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 3? Or do you look at what Peter says about what beauty looks like in a woman and say, well, that's just so antiquated. That's traditional. I'm, I'm not for that at all. <laughs> Whose standard are you following? Well, TikToks, not God's. Not, not uh, the words of Jesus through the apostles either. And men, again, it can come down to modesty for men as well. What are you covering? Are you covering what God said that you're supposed to? Have you even looked into what God said you're supposed to cover? Or, or do you just, you know, see things online? And do you see how, you know, what the culture tends to say, which, you know, it's, it's, it's different for men and women? Well, to a degree, maybe. But there is still many things that God says universally is nakedness. And then you have, some, you have a man going around and running around the neighborhood with his shirt off and exposing parts that God said that's not for everybody to see. It can go both ways. And so we need to be careful that we haven't just completely neglected God's word. Like David in 1 Chronicles chapter 13, he just didn't think about it. It can be those very simple moments, those very quick, just the moments that we're not thinking where we do make that mistake. And so if we don't start with what is satisfactory to God, all you're doing is using God's name to act like you have his approval, to rubber stamp the action or the thing that you're doing. That's not okay. We need to make sure that we are trying to strive after the, the, the example of Christ, to imitate him in every single way, especially our attitudes when it comes to the authority of the Father. So certainly, as th this, this 
really affects a lot of the things that we've talked about already this morning, but it definitely also is consistent with God's expectations of how to become a Christian on conversion. Yet so many people often start, when we are trying to have a Bible study with someone, they start with what they would prefer in conversion. Maybe they don't like how, what baptism sounds like. Maybe they don't like what that means in, for their family, even. Maybe they have a hard time with repentance because there are some things that I'm just not willing to get rid of yet. But guess what? That, that's not starting with the mind of God. That's starting with the mind of the old man. And what we're trying to do is put that man to death. So I would just add to that, it is the greatest compliment to God when we try to emulate his son. But on the other hand, it is the greatest insult when we say, I, I think I can do better. Or you know what, I think I can do maybe a little bit differently. I don't need that as much. The greatest insult. Our job is to try and imitate Christ in the best way that we can. And so maybe you're a Christian. Are you, are you someone who's already given your life to Christ and has given yourself to his authority but is struggling to put on the mind of Christ? Or rather to put it back on. Maybe you lost that kind of attitude. We would love to help you. The family uh, at Lakeside here would love to try and help you in that, put that attitude back on. If you're not a Christian, would you allow Jesus to guide you into righteousness that you might be able to join him in eternity with the glory of God that has yet to be, re has yet to be fully realized as Paul talks about in Romans chapter 8? We would love that for you. But guess what? You only get to that point if you have this kind of mindset if you decide that you are going to go to God for every answer and no one else. Are you willing to do that? To have that beautiful blessing, that great reward of salvation to be with God forever and ever. If you're subject to the invitation of Christ by any means, please let your need be made known. Come forward as we stand and as we sing.